I'm back to speaker for a step. Uh, I don't think I need to present him again. But thank you again for the video. I can say that at least. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, you have one hour max for talking. So, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Kevin, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming back. Um, good, so uh, the paper is titled Essence Without Modality, question, question mark. Um, provocative title, um, but I'm going to be talking about the uh, relationship between essence and modality, unsurprisingly. Um, and uh, the goal here is really to, to, uh, to sketch a theory of modality uh, based on essence, uh, which, which you might call a reductive theory of Modality. And that's that's where we get uh, the essence without modality. Uh, essence is sometimes conceived as a modal concept. If you conceive it as a non-modal concept, but as a basis of modality, then effectively you get essence without modality. But the point point of the uh, the idea is that you get um, a basis for modal truths uh, from essence. And I'm not actually going to take much of a stand on whether essence itself is a modal notion or not. Uh, the point is just that we can we can ground or uh, reduce all modal truths to, to essentialist truths. Now, in the background is of course um, probably familiar to most of you, sort of a neo-Aristotelian view of, of modality and essence, uh, based on the work of uh, people like Kit Fine and E.J. Lowe. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and. Uh, I've got a paper published uh, called Possibility Precedes Existence, uh, Precedes Actuality rather, um, which, is, uh, which is a kind of a background for this paper. So I'm taking that as a starting point, but I, I'll go through some of the things I say in that because I don't assume that you, <laughs> you've all seen that before. But I'm trying to go a bit beyond uh, um, in, the, in this sort of overall project where I'm, where I'm uh, working on um, the basis for moral truths. Okay, so. So the background, as I say, is Aristotelian or, or Neo-Aristotelian, Finian essentialism, um, where essence is prior to modality. So uh, you, you might think of uh, Fine's paper, uh, Essence and Modality, where, uh, where, where this, this view is popularized. But, but E.J. Lowe has a number of papers where he talks about very similar uh, ideas. And uh, I often take Lowe as, as, uh, as, my, as my starting point because he was, he was my my supervisor and, and, uh, and, and mentor. So uh, he has, has a couple of nice little um, phrases. Uh, one of them is on your handout there from his possibility of metaphysics. He says, metaphysical possibility is an inescapable determinant of actuality. Um, now that's a bit of a puzzling phrase in itself, but the thought here is that possibility or modal truths like this uh, come in some sense before actuality. And he had both an epistemic and an ontological agenda for that, that type of uh, notion. So he also says that it's a precondition of something's existing, that its essence, along with the essences of other existing things, doesn't not preclude its existence. And then we've got these two, two um, uh, phrases on the handout, essence precedes existence and possibility precedes actuality. And I took the second one of those and I published a paper with that, with that title. I, I sometimes have to specify that uh, the essence precedes existence uh, quote is not uh, in reference to Sartre, <laughs> who defends <laughs> the opposite of this, that existence precedes essence. This is, this is a different kind of thesis, um, perhaps not entirely unrelated, but uh, in any case, uh, the, the context is, is, is slightly different. Uh, but Whatever we're going to say about this sort of relationship between essence and existence, or essence and modality, it's it's going to have to involve some specification of what essences are supposed to be, and that I find is often the most difficult part of my discussion with anyone because people come with very uh, strong preconceptions of what they think essence is. Often it's based on uh, on Kripke's work, of course, um, but Kripke never really specified what he means by essence anyway, so that's not entirely helpful. Um, Certainly, I do not mean uh, to commit to anything like uh, Kripkean origin essentialism or anything like this when I when I talk about essence. So, so those are those are things to, to be to be specified. So, um, Lowe says some things that I agree on about what he thinks essences are, but he also didn't really specify the notion of essence in as much detail as you might hope. 
So he says that essences are not entities themselves, and I agree with that. Um, but then he specifies, citing Locke, that, well, the essence is just the very being of, of a thing. <laughs> and that, that, that doesn't necessarily add anything, <laughs> anything much to, to what you, you might have already given, been given. And, uh, of course, Fein, Fein uh, talks in similar ways sometimes and talks about real definition as well. But Fein sometimes writes as if essences are some kind of entities, actually. Uh, and I'm not sure whether he intends to commit to that idea, but he sometimes writes in a, in a way that suggests that essences are a type of proposition or a set, perhaps. And of course, there are people who think that that is the case. And some people also think that essences are just bundles of, of properties, sort of a bundle theory of essence. Now, none of these views are right if essences are not entities themselves, because all those things that I've mentioned, sets, propositions, uh, I suppose bundles of properties or properties themselves, they are entities. Right? So what are essences if they're not entities? And uh, why couldn't they be entities? Well, Lowe has a little bit of an argument, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but he thinks that essences themselves cannot be entities on pain of infinite regress. And uh, the reasoning is as follows, if every entity has an essence, which is uh, a view shared by uh, a lot of people who talk about essences, then it seems that uh, essences themselves would have to have an essence. And if the essence of those essences is an entity, then that essence itself would have to have an essence. And this does not look like a promising route to specify <laughs> what essences are. Um, there's a couple of papers contributing to that. We can talk more about it if you're, if you're interested in, in this uh, question. But uh, but I take it as a starting point that essences themselves cannot be entities. But we need to specify what they are supposed to be then, right? So I, I propose to, to read the notion of essence as, as shorthand for something like this. The identity and existence conditions of an entity. So the essence, you might say, expresses or states the identity and existence conditions of an entity. Now, it's easy to slip up to here, and, and, and I often do that in, in speaking because it's difficult to avoid it, that uh, essence is a proposition expressing the identity and existence conditions of an entity. But of course, the essence is not a proposition. <laughs> uh, it's not a sentence. It's not a linguistic entity. It's, uh, but we can say that to state something's essence is to state its identity and existence conditions. Right. Okay. So all you have in are the entities, and indeed on the view that I'm developing here, all you have are actual entities. So this is going to be a sort of actualist theory of modality, if you like, this sort of old-fashioned way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, all the actual entities have an essence. So when we talk about essences, we're talking about the relationships uh, between those actual entities um, and uh, you know, relationships such as dependence relations between those actual entities. And the thought is that just by looking at those actually existence conditions in which includes the dependence relations between the entities, we can uh, get get the truth makers for the moral truth. Okay, so I'm gonna have to give you some examples as I go on uh, so that we get to the bottom of what uh, what essences are supposed to be on this view. But uh, I'll just I thought I might read a quote where where Lowe specifies him, his, uh, his sort of neo-Aristotelian or fine connective view of essence as well. So Lowe, Lowe cites um, a passage, well, he doesn't cite the passage, but he, he refers to Fine's book, The Modality of Attempts, and I think he has this passage in mind when he tries to specify the, the essentialist view. So let me just read this from Fine's Modality of Attempts. Uh, Kit, Kit Fine says, Although there may be something about how the matter of Socrates turns out that is relevant to its constituting a man, there is nothing about how Socrates himself turns out that is relevant to his being a man. If I am right, then this means that philosophers have been mistaken in thinking that Socrates cannot be a man unless he exists, that existence must precede essence. Socrates must already be a man, if I may put it that way before the question of how things turn out for him can even arise. <laughs> so, it's a funny way of writing there from, from Kip Fine, but uh, I think the thought is, um, is right, that there's something uh, that is the essence of Socrates, as it were, uh, that we must, must have, have uh, either grasped epistemically or, or 
must be the case ontologically before we can uh, specify uh, how things stand for the actual Socrates. In other, in other words, the essence of Socrates precedes his existence, and that is just to say that the identity and existence conditions of Socrates uh, precede his existence. So before we know what Socrates is, we must know what must hold for him to exist. So I think that the idea of, of essence preceding existence and the conception of essence as identity and existence conditions of entities is actually on the background of a lot of the things that Fine says as well, but he never states it very clearly. So this, this passage that I just read is probably the closest that I've come to, to find the idea in his work. Okay, um, so uh, this view, of course, relates to this idea that, that modality is grounded in essence or, or moral truths are true in virtue of essentialist truths. And I'm going to return to that reductive question later on. But a couple of preconditions to, to sort out first as well. So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of what the identity and existence conditions could be later on. But I can already say something a bit more. Um, I think that the, the basis of the conditions, and I've written this on the handout as well, will have to be the categorical structure of reality, whatever we think that structure to be. And the formal ontological relations that hold between the categories would, would govern that structure. Now, if you're operating in a, in a EJLO-inspired ontology, he's, he's defending a four-category ontology, where we have uh, two kinds of universal, substantial kind universals, and I talked a little about yesterday, property universals and uh, tropes or modes, so particularized properties uh, and substance or individuals. Now I'm not going to be committing to that four category ontology view, but I'm sympathetic to the distinction between substantial kind universals uh, or natural kind universals and uh, property universals. Um, so you might say that some of the formal ontological relations that govern these sort of, this sort of categorical structure are the relations between these different kinds of categories. So Lowe himself talks about instantiation and characterization. So, so the kind universals are characterized by the property universals. You know, if uh, water is a natural kind, it's characterized by, I don't know, it's boiling point or melting point or something like that. Um, or, um, or you might say that uh, uh, the that the property universals must always be instantiated in some substance, uh, so following a principle of an instantiation, which we also talked a little bit about yesterday. So these would be requirements uh, that govern the categorical structure of reality. And as I say, I'm not committing to any particular view about this now, but uh, if, you, if you think that this sort of categorical, uh, categorical analysis is the right way to go in the first place, then you can apply the, what I'm saying into, into whatever your preferred view on this might be, I hope. Okay, uh, one final thing, which I also touched on yesterday a little bit when I talked about substantial kind universals, is that I'm uh, only going to be operating with the notion of general essence, really, so general or natural kind essence, um, rather than individual essence. Now, here I depart from, from Lowe's work, because Lowe talked about individual essences, but I think that the Aristotelian basis is uh, more sympathetic to just the general essences, uh, or natural kind essences. I've used these more or less synonymously. Um, maybe I should state the, uh, the distinction. I think I have a quote from, from Lowe where, where he makes this distinction. So, might as well use that. So, so Lowe says, X is general essence, is what it is to be a K, you know, ob object of kind K, while X's individual essence is what it is to be the individual of kind K that X is, as opposed to any other individual of that kind. Uh, that kind of idea of a general essence uh, can be found also, for instance, in Fabrice Correa's work, who talks about objectual essen essences. And the thought then would be that all the members of a, of a given natural kind would share the same general essence. Um, and they wouldn't have any necessarily any individual essences above, uh, over and above that. Okay. Good. So, so I'm approaching the, the end of the first section. Um, so here are three assumptions that I put on the handout. Essences are not entities. I'll try to specify that idea. They're the identity and existence conditions of entities. Two, I'm, I am committed to this idea that every entity has an essence, but not an individual essence, a general essence. And three, only actual entities exist. So that's the actualist uh, 
modal ontology that I'm trying to, to build out of this uh, this view. Now, that obviously leaves open the question how we're going to find the truth makers for, for modal, interesting modal truths in the, in the actual entities. So I'm going to try to give you some examples of how we might, might go about that. All right. Uh, hope that makes roughly sense so far. We can, we can go into details a bit further uh, in discussion as needed. Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Please. Uh, you seem that uh, you take a sense uh, to be uh, uh, conditions of possibility of identity and existence of an entity. But, yes, but on the other hand, you know, uh, the senses are not uh, entities. Okay. But do, do a senses exist then? Because uh, if only actual entities exist, there seems to be a contradiction. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that essences exist because only, only entities exist. So, um, so the entities exist, and by their very existence, it means that there are some conditions for their existence, right? So, or, uh, or how, do you, how do you identify one? What, what distinguishes this entity from this entity? That would be its identity conditions. So, so essences are not entities, they do not exist, right? Um, so, so, I mean, if you like, it is a type of anti-realism by essence, but also the notion of essence is at the very core of the ontology that I'm building. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a it's just a question of reading it um, in in the in the right way, but as I say, it's it's very easy to slip in in, in speaking into into sort of reifying essences, uh, saying like, oh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I'm gonna give you the essence of this object now, but it's, that is that is just to talk about the object in question and to to tell you how that object depends on or differ, differs from from other objects. But it wouldn't be clear to say just that. Uh, your entity is only your actual entity and exist, fine. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, the, uh, but it's uh, necessary uh, all entities have, uh, and they have conditions for identity and uh, uh, as existence. And there are uh, those, uh, uh, so, well, there's a modality necessarily. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, yeah um. Well, I mean, if, the, if we're in the business of trying to reduce modality to, to essence, then, then I, I better not uh, use a primitive modality in, in defining, in defining that, uh, those identity of existence conditions. But the thought here is, of course, that the identity of existence conditions will have modal implications, right? So, so anticipating a little bit. <coughs> so, I mean, strictly speaking, I could, I could talk about all of these things without mentioning essences at all. I could just talk about identity and, identity and existence conditions. But it is often quicker and easier to talk about the essence of the entity as a sort of a shorthand uh, for for the identity and existence conditions because um, then once we specify that, then we should be hopefully on the same page. But, but uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to I have to go into further detail. But, but. I have a short question for um, You say <coughs> sorry. Um, every entity has a general essence. Is this uh, just an essence? Existential quantifier, or you mean uniqueness uh, as a unique general essence? Right. So, I do not mean to say that it's a unique okay. general essence. So, so um, I think this came up yesterday as well a little bit. So, I think well, if we are if we are all humans, we all share the same general essence. We all participate in the same general essence, which is just to say that we all have the same identity and existence conditions with regard to that natural kind being a human or being a living organism or what, what have you. And indeed all gold atoms, if you like, share the same general essence of, uh, you know, having topic number 79 if we use that, <laughs> that example. So, so uh, every natural kind needs to have a unique essence, right? right. But every, every entity doesn't have to have a unique essence. Right? Right. Typically they will have many essences, right? Uh, if if you, you them. yeah if if it's so and to be I say typically entities will have many essences yeah the will have many yeah so <coughs> so yes but I mean I guess that's controversial yeah. uh, so so yeah, you might you might say you might say you know <coughs> all electrons share in this, having the essence of electron but they also have the essence of being a fermion you know? right. Uh, 
but but here we are here we're already postulating that there are higher level kinds you know you might say that there's just the fundamental natural kinds and those are uh, the most precise kind so well so we can make a distinction on on the narrowest kind that an entity uh, belongs to as it were and then we can leave open uh, whether there are other higher level kinds that the entity belongs to you know you might say well the electron is also a matter material particle and all material things share the same general essence of being you know a material entity or something like that now now whether that is a kind that whether that is a general essence that uh, is is, is uh, the genuine essence, as it were, might be, might be debatable. But I, I, I'll leave that to one side now. But you could you could read this all, and I'm maybe I should say that I am slightly sympathetic to the idea that you could read this all very reductively, if you like. There are just fundamental natural kinds, and there is only one, the narrowest essence, general essence that every entity has. But, but I mean, it's the right question to ask. Let me just have a follow-up. Mm. Uh, so it would be uh, a simple open to the idea of pluralism, pluralism uh, to racial pluralism then, if you have different natural kinds that are uh, from the same entity. So if there is different uh, conditions for existence, then so there is probably a different way to exist for uh, one entity if it has different kind. So, uh, I'm not sure if I followed you entirely. So you have pluralism in, in the sense that... You, you say that uh, general essence is a condition of existence for an entity, so if an entity yeah. has different general essence, it has different conditions for existence, so you, does it have different way to exist then? Are you okay with logical pluralism? Well, mm, I'm not sure if, if you have to <coughs> commit to anything very radical, even if you are open to that. So, uh, so as I said, I mean, uh, to use the example that I mentioned, you know, if the electron is, is both a fermion and, a, and an electron, uh, it's not like these these conditions are in, in contradiction or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, indeed, to, to be an electron, you have to be a fermion. Um, presumably, so uh, so uh, the question is whether there's a hierarchy of these natural kinds, right? And then you do have tricky cases there uh, because you you might have uh, um, you might have entities. Uh, well, you might have examples that don't follow a neat hierarchical structure of natural kinds like this. So there's some discussion about like Emma Tobin, for instance, is a good discussion about these sort of cases. So. Uh, I mean, it gets tricky when you, especially when you talk, start to talk about biological kinds, for instance. Um, but I, I would, so there's, there's debate to be had that I would, I would kind of leave them open. But, you know, if in doubt, you might say, well, there are no biological kinds in the world, <laughs> if they're not fundamental. So, so you, can, you, can just, you can just start, I'd be satisfied if we could, if we could just start with the, with the ontology of fundamental natural kinds and then we can we can specify further depending on on, on our other views. Yeah? Happy? <laughs> Good. I mean, I'm not saying I've solved all the problems on the way here, but you know, before we get to, to, to the nitty gritty, um, I'll try to give you some examples, I guess, as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, so, so let me. Um, let me go to the second second section. So on, on candid essences and essential dependence. So so here's a potentially controversial claim based on what, what we discussed yesterday as well. Uh, any logically coherent set, and, and by logically I hear me sort of like classical logic, uh, any logically coherent set of identity and existence conditions is a candid essence for an entity that could exist. Uh, so a candid entity, if you like. And we do need to make this distinction for epistemic reasons because we don't know what all the things are that exist, you know. Uh, to, uh, to, use, uh, to, use an, uh, to use an example, dark matter. Well, we refer to dark matter in our scientific theories. Maybe we don't quite have an established view about whether dark matter exists or not. Uh, but we know what it does, some of the things that it does, if it does exist or if it would exist. So we, we say dark matter is a candidate entity that would would serve certain roles in our theories if it, if it did exist, um, but uh, we don't we don't have you know conclusive uh, evidence for its existence. So we can state it, it's candid essence because only the existing entities have essences. So dark matter does not have an essence if it doesn't exist, right? So there might be some other entity that explains the things that we think dark matter explains, um, which which does exist, and it might have some of the same identity and existence conditions as this candid entity dark matter, but perhaps it would be slightly different. 
So, so, so <coughs> we, we, have, we have to have some to talk about, about those sort of cases, cases just because of obviously some limitations. So I, I propose to just put the word candidate in front before, before we uh, express our, uh, you know, uh, more firm commitment to the existence of, of some entity. Good. Um, so, I mean, fairly through your point, but, but perhaps worth make, making. Um, and as so I noted earlier, earlier, and this, is, this goes with, uh, with something that Lowe Lo said in the quote that I had, had earlier on there, essences of other existing things can preclude the existence of, of, of candidate entities. So what we're interested in is, is coming up with a collection of entities, collection of identity and existence conditions, if you like, um, that uh, are mutually possible, are mutually uh, not contradictory. Because whatever the actual entities are that exist, they better not preclude each other's existence. Now, it's not easy to come up with good examples of this, but trying to think of some examples, I'm, I'm thinking if, if we are committed to the existence of oxygen, and we think we've got good, good evidence for the existence of oxygen, that might be seen to preclude the existence of phlogiston, which was used as a, as a sort of candidate essence or candidate entity that could have explained some of the things that... Uh, now we know oxygen exists. Oxygen exists. So it would seem uh, that those two things are probably not going to exist at the same same time because their identity existence conditions would would uh, would conflict in some ways. Now, I haven't worked out this example in detail. Maybe it would be an interesting exercise to do so. Um, but that might be one example. Okay. So uh, if that's true, if we have cases like that, then that obviously has something that look like direct modal implications. So the existence of one entity X might necessitate the existence of another entity Y, but it also might preclude the existence of a third entity. Um, I have gave you an example of this preclusion, which is a trickier case. It's much easier to state uh, connections uh, of, of necessitation or, or, or dependence um, like this. So, so if, if water molecules exist, then uh, they seem to depend for their existence of hydrogen and oxygen atoms existing. And uh, we can model all these sort of relations with, uh, with essential dependence relations, ontological dependence relations. So I've, give, I've given you just two on the, on the, uh, on the handout. Um, so the first one, EDE, is, is effectively a rigid kind of dependence relation. So an entity would depend on a specific entity for its existence. If it's part of the essence of that entity, that it only exists if the other entity exists. Now, I should maybe say that there, are, there might not be very easy examples of this if you don't think that there are individual essences, um, because you they'd be looking for something, some particular entity that all the entities of a given natural kind would depend on for their existence. But there might be one easy example. Um, Namely, uh, the uh, the natural kind universal itself, if it is an entity. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, you know, t take the water example. So, uh, if if it's part of the essence of uh, of the natural kind water, that all its members uh, depend on, on on oxygen atoms for their existence, then then we might might need that property universal oxygen. Uh, if, uh, if that is a, a property universal, uh, that uh, that natural kind of universal rigid depends on. But it's not so easy to come up with uh, with sort of um, uh, examples that are not directed from the formal ontological framework. Generic dependence will get us much further though, um, and that's the that's the looser connection here anyway. So we might say that every um, every sample of of, uh, of a given natural kind, such as such as uh, Water will depend for its existence on there being those oxygen and hydrogen <coughs> atoms, but not on any particular <coughs> oxygen and hydrogen atoms. So uh, it just means that there needs to be some examples of those uh, of those uh, uh, other entities in existence. So, so, so that's why it's a generic generic dependence relation. Um, so. Those sort of modeling relations, uh, essential mod dependence relations, will will uh, will help us to 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 put a bit more structure to the model space. That's the that's the idea here. Uh, and I think that that already gives us uh, more or less all the things that we need to to build up the, the ontology 
uh, for modality based on essential dependence relations that I'm proposing here. But I can give you a little bit more examples on the way. Um, yeah, I, I think I have some more examples on the, on the next page anyway. But I, I, I think I might push on to the third section already and, and get back to those examples. Because there are a couple of things on the background here just about the re relationship between essence and modality that uh, might, might, uh, might be puzzling and have been addressed in the literature. So if we have this type of picture of reducing modality to essence, uh, call it finding and essentialism, then uh, there might be issues that, that pe people could take with it and indeed uh, uh, Wallner and Wydia have, have taken issue with, with just this type of reductive finding and essentialism. So I have their definition for FE or finding and essentialism on the handout there. So every metaphysically necessary truth is grounded in one or more essentialist truths. Now that is more or less what I've been proposing proposing to you here. But if that's, if that's uh, the, the statement of finding and essentialism, then you might think that you can't get the kind of reductive analysis that I was proposing from this. Um, they, they, in fact, they cite me being so committed as well, so that's why I'm wanting to address this issue. <laughs> um, so they don't regard this type of eliminatist reduction plausible that we, you might have to have to have some sort of double primitivism, perhaps, that you've got essence and modality in this sort of picture and grounding as well. Uh, because uh, uh, they say X, X being fully grounded in, a, in another entity, Y, is not typically thought to entail that the grounded X is not real. And you can, you can say, find yourself on this. Uh, there, there are questions about the relationship between grounding and reduction in the background here, but that is a pretty common way to think about grounding, that it doesn't entail. Um, re reduction, certainly not eliminate this reduction like, like the one that I've, I've been sort of hinting at. Now, I think it's a mistake to formulate finding an essentialism like this. Now, or maybe I should say the type of essentialism that I have committed to any, in any case, leaving fine, fine to one side. I think that if we do want to give a reductive analysis of finality in terms of essence, which, I, which I'd like to do, um, we have to do something a little bit different. It's just to say that every essential truth has these modal implications that I've been hinting at before. And more specifically, if you look at an example in, in the line that I've, I've formulated before, on the second page of the handout, take the essence of uh, something like methane. If, if that essence of methane uh, suggests that methane contains hydrogen, then that should be read as methane depending generically on its existence of uh, uh, on hydrogen, and that generic dependence relation will give you that necessitation, uh, that modal implication that we were we were looking for here already. Now, then it would just follow that all instances of methane must contain hydrogen by necessity. And once we see that that's the case, if we have evidence for for thinking that that's a good uh, candidate for the essence of meth methane, as it were, uh, then uh, then that's really all we need to establish the moral truth. That's relevant here. Now, that doesn't need, need to involve any reference to grounding in the formulation of that essentialist truth. But you might still think that there's there's something that is, is missing here from the formulation. So, effectively, the idea that every metaphysically necessary truth is is ipso facto an essentialist truth. Um, so, if that's if that's a worry, uh, that is a worry that has been formulated by Wydia and Wallen themselves and also by, by, by Anton Wamawatsi who talks about yeah, sort, of a, uh, sort of epistemic friction in, in these sort of cases. So how do we come to know uh, that every essential truth is, uh, is a metaphysically necessary truth? Uh, or, or the other way around, every metaphysically necessary truth and essential truth. How, how do you know that? You need some sort of bridge principle before you can, you can make this sort of uh, uh, inference, if you like. So, I've got a quote here from Wydia and Wallner who, who tried to compare this to another case of re reduction. And, uh, and I think that's a, that's a good way to, to try to think about what's going on here. So, the reduction of biological facts to chemical facts, if, if there is such a reduction. So, they suggest that the mere fact that biological facts could be reduced to chemical facts, if that is indeed true, would rest on the identification 
or some sort of bridge principle that takes us from one special science to another science. So what it is that allows us to reduce biological facts to chemical facts. And that bridge principle would then be what justifies you in your inference for in specific instances of the general reducibility of biological facts to chemical facts. So if you want to say um, protein function reduces to uh, you know chemical uh, properties, something that I thought about before, then you would need some sort of a general principle about reducibility of uh, uh, biology to chemistry, whatever that might be, in order to be able to infer that, on, in, in order to, to support that inference. Now, I'm not sure what you thought, think about that particular example, but uh, I think that there's a, there's a broad, broader issue, a broader mistake or confusion that goes if we try to make that type of, uh, that type of argument. And the issue is just this. The bridge principle that we're interested in here doesn't operate at the level of, of uh, the individual agent who's doing the inf inferring in a particular case. Uh, so the individual agent's model epistemology. That's a, that should be at the level of our theory of model epistemology, if you like. So if you already, to take it back to the essence modality case, if you already buy into the Feynian essentialist picture, which, which I certainly do, then it just follows that every um, every uh, metaphysical necessary truth is, is an essentialist truth. Whether you whether you know it or not, whether an individual agent knows it knows it or not. So so uh, similarly in the in the biology and chemistry case, if you, uh, if you have that basis for if you have that reductive basis in, in chemistry for a given biological truth, that reductive basis is there whether you know that <laughs> That is the case, or or not. So if you if you know the chemical basis for it, then you have the you have the tools to, uh, as it were, express the biological truth, whether you actually know that there's this general reduction between biology and chemistry or not. And in fact, I think that we operate more on the on the basis of those individual cases anyway when we when we do when we try to perform such reductions. So, so I think that there's, there's a question here for individual model epistemology when, when you try to make inferences, and then there's a question for the level of the theory uh, of, of, of model epistemology. And once you've bought in the theory, you get the reductions for, for free or almost, if you like. Um, so, go ahead. But if you put the universe, so to speak, by hand, bridge principle, isn't that the term the the and uh, Well, no. I mean, the bridge. So good. So the bridge principle, whatever, whatever it is, it still needs justification, right? But you don't justify it in, in the same way as you justify the individual cases necessarily. So if you if you buy into Feynman essentialism, why why would you why would you do that? Well, probably because you've read Fine's essence, essence of Modality and you've seen examples of the singles of Socrates uh, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, the idea that, um, well, maybe, maybe you don't buy the singles of Socrates example based on, based on the laughter, but whatever, whatever the examples might be that are, are, are plausible here. Um, so so those, those sort of examples are supposed to motivate the general theory, right? That there, there, there is, this, is this bridge principle. But... Um, uh, so, so you don't you don't put the bridge principle in by in by hand, as it were. You try to develop a theory based on examples, right? But if you if you've got the theory there, it's not like you always have to go and refer to the bridge principle in, in each one of those cases. You, you, if you think that that theory is true, then then you've established that there is this connection between uh, essence and modality. Well, reduction, in, in fact, in, in this case, between essence and modality. Another thing, you're coming back to uh, water or, or methane. Um, if the equipment would say, for example, that your water is at H2O, mm. uh, or methane is uh, uh, at H3, uh, H3. CH4. Um, at H4, yes. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, but then, but then if you, if you, if you think that the equipment here mm. thinks that you know, that's what the water is, I mean, the other logic of dependence of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 water on, uh, on oxygen, it becomes an empty cup. As it is. 
So uh, you're going to need the uh, you're going to need the empirical work that establishes the connection between uh, water and whatever it might depend on. So so it seems to me that what, what whatever we're doing here, it's, it's not going to become analytical now. Now, I, I mean, I think what, what you have in mind is something like the kind of the old Kripke, Kripke Putnam proof for the nece necessary a posterior, right? Which, it, which is something like, well, you need um, um, the, the necessity of identity, right? Which is almost almost like an analytical truth in this sort of in this sort of scenario. After you've got the empirical, uh, after you've got the empirical truth, is that is that kind of what you have in no, mind? No, I, I, I think I, I agree. Well, I disagree. With Putnam, I think that mm. uh, the, uh, the water is in the first place uh, uh, identified uh, by uh, uh, empirical properties, yeah. and then by, Good. as you said, by uh, uh, empirical work and scientific work, you discover that the well, at least in our world, the water is H H two H two O, right? And uh, so uh, I think that. Uh, uh, I think that's a necessary truth, huh? but it's not an ethical truth. Okay. So I, t I think I tend to agree with you. Huh? So, so well, my, my question was, you know, how would you reply to put them? You know, because that's what was my, my, basically my, 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 my query. You know. mm. But I think you already answered, you know, since you have to do a bit of the work. Yeah, yeah. So, so it is. Oh, it, it ought to be based on, uh, I mean, look, so where I take issue, maybe this is a better way of putting it, where I take issue with some of the sort of classic Kripke Putnam picture on this, or at least how it's sometimes presented, is that uh, there's much more packed into that empirical part than we, than we often acknowledge. It's not just, well, we've discovered the empirical truth now. Well, no, you've, you've discovered some dependencies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and that's that's what gives you the ontological structure, the dependencies between uh, between you know water and, and its and its uh, constitutive parts, presumably. Uh, so uh, so the, the, that empirical part is much richer in in ontological content, if you like, uh, than than it's sometimes put. And and, and indeed, it's not purely a a posterior right necessarily either, because those dependencies. No, I, I, I think I was mistaken by misled by the uh, expression "rich principle" in the old. Oh yeah. You know, uh, positivistic, uh, yeah, yeah. So the bridge principle is kind of the old. I mean, this is how why they're more talking about. It. Bit, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I wouldn't use necessarily the notion of bridge principle there my, my, myself, but that's the old. Yeah, okay. That is the old-fashioned way of putting what you need for a reduction, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, or, or even a negating of reduction, right? Um, but yeah, okay, agreed. I think we're roughly on the same page. Good. Okay. Um, Good. Well, I'm, I've taken a fair bit of time already, but it's good that we've we've been able to kind of clarify some of the issues as we as we go. So, so I can I, I could go to the last section, um, which might not take me too long, but there's there's a sort of case study that we could spend a lot of time on, but maybe I'll just mention it. Um, so, so I've, I've labelled the final section as consequences of of, of the view, uh, which is I mean, partially this is just a summary of some of the things I've already said. So, so as I said, the goal is an actualist basis for uh, for modality. So actuality would have to consist of entities that could exist. In that sense, possibility precedes actuality because those entities need to be possible in order to exist. Uh, but we need some restrictions for this, and this is something that came up yesterday. Um, I think I think that um, a, co a candidate restriction is, is law of non-contradiction. Uh, I think it might be one as I've written there. You know, I, I'm open to debate about it, but I've uh, I've defended the uh, uh, the validity of law of prediction as a metaphysical constraint on, on existence rather than rather than just a logical principle. Um, and as I s said, the category of structural reality, whatever you think it, it is exactly, would would be a constraint on this because that's where you would get the dependencies between the various categories. And indeed, you can use the essential dependence relations to. Uh, to formulate those restrictions, so so you might think that if there's something like the principle of instantiation that holds, then those uh, universals must always be instantiated. That's the Aristotelian uh, 
principle here, and that gives you a type of uh, 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 a type of uh, dependence relation between between the categories. And you might think that well, the natural kind must all, always be connected with certain property properties because uh, you know the properties make the natural kind what it is. So a natural kind would uh, would always depend on certain properties, even rigid, rigidly. So so you don't have the natural kind without those property universals existing. And the property universals you might think uh, have some sort of dependence to the kind as well. Um, you know, depending on what your views are. So, whatever you uh, your views about the on categorical structure of reality are, that would give you uh, uh, the sort of base dependence relations that you'd have to you'd have to follow in setting setting this type of picture up. I've mentioned laws of nature there as well. And of course, uh, on this type of view, you might think that laws of nature are, are metaphysically necessary because all the actual if all the actual things exist, uh, then then the model uh, model states of laws better be connected to those those things. So uh, sh should appeal to a dispositional essentialist, but whatever you want to say about laws of nature will probably influence this picture as well. Sorry, one question by actuality. Do you just mean the actual things? Yeah, the things that actually exist. Not something that is the property of being actual. No, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, no, just the actual things. So whatever properties do actually exist. Not the property of being actual. <laughs> uh, the, the actually existing entities. Uh, so be them properties and, and uh, uh, if you think substances, wh whatever whatever the, the entities are that the ontology consists of. Well, if they exist, then they, they should give rise to, to this, this type of structure. Um, good. Uh, so we can we can discuss discuss the constraints further, but uh, whatever the constraints are, there's still going to be obviously a lot of these candidate entities, candidate essences. So so I always think that model epistemology is, is, is very hard because of this. Um, so it's not easy to to know which things actually exist because we don't have the full sets of uh, uh, dependence on existence conditions for all the things that, and full evidence for their existence. Um, but I think we can make some progress, and here's why I mentioned this case study. So, <coughs> so Lo, Lo has mentioned in passing the case of transuranic elements as a nice case of where uh, essence precedes existence, because uh, it turns out a lot of the uh, transuranic elements that don't exist in nature uh, were uh, predicted before they were synthesized. So, you know, take something like Einsteinium. If we hadn't synthesized it, uh, it it doesn't seem that it would, it would ever have existed, but we already knew its properties, you know, to a decent level of accuracy before we ever synthesized it, because we can make these predictions based on the periodic table of elements. So, very nice, nice case. But Lowe didn't say very much about the details. I've looked into it in much more detail uh, later on, so I'd, I'd be, I'd be sort of happy to talk about it, but maybe I shouldn't spend too much time on it. Um, so I've got I've got some content on that in the uh, possibility possibility proceed actuality paper, but I've got another piece on uh, the model basis of scientific modeling and how it's synthesis that where I discuss this. So we could we could talk about this in more detail in discussion if that interests you. But um, the core of the matter is 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 basically this: um, if if we can make true claims about those transuranic elements that perhaps ones that haven't been synthesized yet, perhaps ones that we never will even synthesize, then that would seem to be a prima facie problem for the type of view I'm developing here, right? Because there needs to be some actual entities that act as truth makers for those moral claims. So I've got, just to give you one example, uh, take the element uh, uh, 126, umbihexium. Doesn't exist, it hasn't been synthesized. It's been hypothesized as a sort of island of stability. Uh, the heaviest element now that has been synthesized is organism, element 118. Um, but if 126 exists, uh, it would have certain properties, presumably. So we, we might state a counterfactual. If, if umbihexium existed, it would have a longer half-life than organism that has been synthesized. Now, is that counterfactual true? Well, if it's true, it, it can't be made true by the entity umbihexium. 
because it doesn't exist, right? And it might be they never will exist if we never synthesize it. So even my four-dimensional view about natural kinds wouldn't help in that case. But I still think that there might be a way to analyze the truth makers for such statements. And uh, the answer lies in the, in the ways that we are able to predict the, the half-life of, uh, of something like uh, umbihexium element 126. Um, and, uh, well, we can go into detail a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that Peter might, might know more about the details than I am. But, but the answer basically has something to do with the so-called magic numbers. So, uh, so this is something that like Eugene, Eugene Wiener coined um, back in the day. So magic numbers are numbers such as 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. So the Umbihexin. Now, that last one corresponds to the hypothetical element. Now, what are these magic numbers? Well, they're effectively uh, combinations of protons and neutrons that appear to produce a higher stability in the nucleus. So combinations of protons and neutrons that are arranged into complete shells within the atomic nucleus. And that's what gives us the, the higher stability of these cases. So we know of the existing cases, you know, the, the other elements, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, and so on. Uh, we know that those are those, uh, those, uh, those elements that, or isotopes of elements that correspond to those uh, magic numbers have, have a higher level of stability. So that's, that's what, what gives us some confidence in postulating that 1, 2, 6 is an island of stability, and indeed that might give you a reason to think that if we did it, manage to synthesize it, that uh, element would have a higher half-life than organism. Not to mention some other properties, but put those aside. So, uh, it would be something about the properties that these sort of elements have, the properties of uh, already existing entities that we have observed and, and uh, know to have uh, higher half-lives that would um, uh, would act as the truth makers of, the, of, of these type of counterfactuals. So, so the proposal is simply that if those sort of counterfactuals are true, and of course they, they might be meaningless or they might turn out to be, be not true in some cases, so I'm not saying that this goes across the board, but there are cases such as this where I think we've got good reasons to think that uh, even though those uh, counterfactuals may seem to have a non-actual target, you know, on the axiom, actually the target is something that we can identify in the actual world based on these sort of partially structural features of, uh, of existing elements. And if that's the right, then, uh, right way to proceed here, then we do have a, kind of a general pattern of tracking the truth makers for, for moral claims in the actually existing entities. And I think that we do a lot of this in science, actually. Um, not just in the case of transuric elements, but that's kind of a neat case because there are predictions that we make about non-existing entities. Now, I mentioned earlier one example, dark matter. We could use that example just as well, in fact. Um, uh, we could even talk about uh, higher level kinds, uh, you know, social groupings, maybe the biological species, and so on. So I don't think that these examples are just limited to fundamental physics. But uh, if you think that there are just fundamental kinds, natural kinds, then of course the, the case would be limited to fundamental physics for a good reason, or would, would look that way. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, in, in case you were worried that we can only do more like Mr. Morty in, in, in theoretical physics. I don't think that's the case, but those are nice, nice, uh, nice examples. Good. Okay. So, so that's the that's the case study. I'm happy to talk more about it if you're interested in it. But uh, that was that was the second point. So, so let me let me finish, and I will be done in the in the hour. So, uh, the third point was that. Only the entities that can exist together can inhabit actuality. And that's something that I've mentioned already in passing, but I think it's worth emphasizing because this is not a, a typical feature of, uh, of an essentialist picture or not, not a feature that is mentioned very often. So I think that we should look at essences, certainly if we use them as a basis for moral epistemology or moral ontology, as a, as a <coughs> holistic picture. So you can't really consider an essence or the identity and existence of conditions of an entity in isolation. And the reason is obvious by now, I hope, because there could be dependence relations to other entities uh, that concern the identity and existence condition of that entity. Now, it could even be that there, there are uh, sort of overarching dependencies among the actually existing entities. I'm thinking of 
some interpretation of quantum mechanics that might might uh, might suggest uh, uh, entanglement across the board, decoherence, and so on. Uh, now that would be an interesting result because you'd have to uh, consider the identity existence conditions of all the existing entities together in some in some sort of way. It seems, but maybe that's a fairly trivial kind of dependence that would would come out of this. The details depend on the on the, on the empirical results, right? But uh, nevertheless, we, we have very clear cases where there are dependence relations between actually existing entities, and we can't consider those in isolation. And that also goes for restricting the existence of uh, you know, some of these candidate entities that, that are ruled out because of the actual existing entities. OK, um, good. Well, the rest of that I've pretty much sorted out. The fourth, fourth one is, is uh, funny and irrelevant, because I know you've been reading about Mac Tugby today. Uh, on this type of view, on the Aristotelian type of type of view, uh, where the actual existence is the base of, of modality, platonic or unrealized possibilities, alien properties, all this has to be ruled out. Sorry, Matt. Uh, <laughs> now, that's not to say that you couldn't build something very similar to this in a platonic ontology, right? Uh, but in some cases, the, the answers to a lot of the questions that I mentioned are, are super easy in that case, because you can say that the truth makers for those moral truths are just the platonic yes. universals that exist there. So, so you don't have to go looking for them in the act. You know, umbihexium case, well, easy. Umbihexium is, is there in the platonic heaven as a universal, and that's the truth maker. But the problem with that is that we don't seem to have any direct epistemic access, you know. Classic problem, platonism, of course, <laughs> to these things. So, uh, so I think that this is um, perhaps a slightly more interesting challenge to try to find the truth makers in the actual world. And if we can pull that off, which I think we might be able to do, that would be uh, 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 perhaps a result of speaking in favour of Aristotelianism. But, you know, we had a good discussion about this with Matt uh, uh, some time ago. So <laughs> I think we are on the same page about a, a lot of the things that you can build um, in terms of the ontology, which just have a different starting point to Good. Now, there we have it, I think. Uh, once we've got all these conditions in place, we've got the limited space of metaphysical possibility, if you like. And uh, I should say that you can reconstruct the possible world semantics out of this if you want to. I haven't talked about possible worlds because I don't need to. But if you want to talk about possible worlds, just take any of the viable co co uh, combinations of the identity and existence condition of entities. Uh, you get a complete possible world. But I should say that I, you know, I, I'd like to think of those possible worlds as maximal in the sense that you have to consider all the entities that exist in those, uh, not in the sort of way that, well, consider a possible world with just these two entities. That's, that, that seems odd, especially if you have your laws of nature which emerges, emerges from uh, the kind of universals or something like this, because what, what would govern the existence of a world which just has you know, two electrons or something like that? Um, but either way, you can you can construct uh, possible worlds out of these if you if you so want. To. Good. Well, if something is possible, then, then 
and also everything that would be logically equivalent to it would be possible and so on. Um, and in some cases, this is uh, very attractive, and especially if, if it's about essence, this seems to be, this hyperdimensional nature seems to be unavoidable because some, I mean, it's essential for me to be self identical, I guess, but it's not essential for me to be that God is self identical. So those are two topologies, they should be, well, uh, I think the same possible worlds, uh, but, but for essence, it seems to be like quite. Intuitively, I think Fine makes this point in several mm. instances. Uh, seems to be fall apart. Uh, I mean, it's quite easy to go against uh, uh, non hyper intentional intuitions that people have uh, as soon as you introduce essence. And so, if you can build a notion of modality based on essence, maybe you can inherit this natural mm -hmm. hyper intentionality. And I'd be very interested in how that then works. Uh, uh, and whether or whether you would like to have a picture back of modality that is very traditional, perky like, uh, sort of flat in the sense of, of, of no hyperdimensional distinctions being in there, or whether you are also open to this more revisionist sort of idea of modality as soon as it's based on. Uh, yeah. well, when you have this ability to, to ground it in, in essence. In some way. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I certainly hope to to inherit the the hyper benefits of a hyper intentional uh, model here, and I think it is it is built into this. I, I mean, I just express it. Uh, I think even more precisely in terms of the uh, the identity and existence conditions, because then we can model the dependencies uh, right. there. So, so I mean, that's. That's effective, effectively on the background of, of even those classic Feynian examples. So if you if we talk about the singleton Socrates case, right? Uh, well, I mean, you can express it in terms of just dependence relations that are in place. So so sets necessarily depend on their members for their existence, uh, and Socrates is a me necessarily member of the of the singleton Socrates. But Socrates does not depend for his existence on the. Uh, on the singleton Socrates, so you can you can uh, finesse those hyper intentional uh, well relations, if you like, um, based on based on this type of talk as well. So I think we can do that now. Uh, I mean, there's work to be done here to uh, to show that you could uh, reconstruct type of classic possible world semantics from this picture. I mean, I suppose I'd be more tempted to start building it from uh, kind of finding a logic of essence, but you know that that work isn't completed, and it's not, you know, someone like Fabrice Correa has done a lot of progress on, on that side as well. Uh, but uh, but you know, there's uh, so I just want to acknowledge that there's there's certainly work to be done to kind of bring this this talk to be equivalent with with the type of typical use of possible world. Uh, semantics, but I, th I think it probably can be can be done. Um, I mean, there might be some differences in the end. You might I, I don't know. You might know this better than I than I do. But well, so, so that would be interesting. Like, do we want to recover it or do we want to destroy it? I mean, uh, you know, it might be like a revisionist project yeah. of, of, of well, these sort of useful ideas after we had and so on. They have been sure. They have community. They have we have been able to think clearly about some intuitions about modality, but maybe it's time for a new uh, idea, and, and so maybe we, sh we should not want to desire to recover everything. Yeah. That, that, that well, know, well, right. I mean, there there will be diff there will be differences, right? So, um, uh, I mean, Lowe developed uh, his own logic for counterfactuals uh, right. but but that work wasn't quite completed and you know someone like Timothy Williamson would take take issue with that because okay. you get you get different results for the Barkham formulas and so on. Uh, so so there's there's a debate to, to be had there and yes you would end up destroying something now of course Tim Williamson is is just uh, uh, being resisting any kind of hyper intentional moves yeah, yeah, yeah. very strongly so yes obviously you can't you can't reconcile those two pictures in, in, entirely and you know, it's it's not going to come as a surprise to them on the hyper intentional account because I do think that the expressive power that we get from there is, is beneficial. Um, but I mean, that said, 
you still want to be able to do all the work that you need to do, whatever you've got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you so, want to have a picture of a picture of that song, but yeah. there are so many debatable things about the traditional picture of counterfactuals that yeah. I mean, you don't necessarily want to have the same theory of counterfactuals as Lewis would speak. That's true. I mean, well, the case of impossible antecedents being, being one that well, we're yeah, not sure. That's like the most interesting one. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, good. So uh, yeah, all, I think I think I agree. I agree with all that. Now I haven't done all the work myself. I, I should say on on on, uh, on kind of working out what what we might be able to retain and what we we might might need to throw away. Um, I think yeah, other people have done some of it. I should actually, now that, now that we talk about this, I should go back to, to um, Lowe's theory of counterfactuals, which, which some people have, have taken issue with, and see whether, whether what I've said here is, is fully compatible with that picture, because then I can just adopt that and, and give, maybe give it a bit of a more of a, of a basis. But I haven't checked that, actually. So I'll, I'll make a note to, to, to do that, because, of course, ultimately it would be nice if we get the formal tools back that we, we need to... Um, uh, you know, need to do formal model model logic. Um, good. So, th thank you, thank you for the question and, and, and some homework for me. I'd be very <laughs> interested in the future work. Good stuff. Thank you for the talk. And yeah, I'll, I think I can guess your answer, but uh, I will come back on the sure. biological kinds. Yeah. And uh, pluralism, because the the. The dominant view in philosophy of biology is that um, for biological individuals, not for any, all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff, but for biological individuals, they have two categories, unit of selection and some kind of generalization of orga organism. And they say that some things are both. So right. some things valid the criteria the, of identity and existence for both. And what what would you say? Could you lose one and stay the same? So, do, for example, you, have you are a unit selection and you are an organism, yeah. but for X Y reason, you're not a unit selection. You lose some properties that are necessary for the criteria to be a unit of selection. Are you still the same individuals if you stay a, an organism? Because the pluralist would like to say yes, and I don't understand how it's possible with that in your kind of view. Well, I haven't thought of that specific question. But um, in general, but kinds that superpose. Yeah. But yeah. are not hierarchical at the same level. That's the, that's the difficulty. Yeah, I, uh, good. I mean, I have thought of, 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 some, of some of those examples, uh, which I can't quite remember by heart. But, uh, but yeah, as I mentioned earlier, Emma Tobin has some, mm -hmm. some nice uh, discussion was, um, on uh, Well, let me put all my cards on the table because I, I don't usually, I, I sometimes have footnotes on this, but, but now I, I think I've, I'm more committed that I think that there's just, uh, there's just one, um, there's just one bi biological kind, as it were, and that's, that's, yeah, that's to be a living, that's to be a living organism, yeah. So that's, that's maybe what you anticipated from what I said yesterday, because uh, I, I've, I've been kind of on the fence on this and I often, often write about uh, the biological examples, as as if they're as if they're you know generally diff generally different kinds. But I I'm inclined to think now that there's just one uh, there's just one biological kind, and it is to be a living organism, and we are all part of that same general kind. Indeed, every living thing is part of that same general kind, and that's uh, that requires taking that four-dimensional picture of the kinds are. But if we have that singular origin of life. We all we can all sort of uh, be traced back to that that same thing. I mean, I think it's kind of a nice, neat picture. Now, then you ask, well, but what about the obvious differences between all the world? Well, you might ask, but some of might ask. <laughs> what about all the obvious differences between the biological class? We need to be able to talk about different species anyway. Well, yes, but we are already able to, and we already have all the competing species concepts, of course. Uh, some of them based on histor more historical properties, some of them based on partially intrinsic properties. Um, it just turns out that all of these are accidental properties. You know, the only essential property for the kind is to be a, you know, a living organism, right? Or, so, or something like whatever it is that the essence of, of uh, 
is, but it's going to be something very general is to do encompass all things. And all the other things are accidental properties, and, and it's not a huge surprise that we get such a variety of them. But it does mean that we can, you can carve up the species space as you like, really. Which is useful because people are already carving up as they like it seems to be, if you, if you look at the different species concepts. Um, now, I mean, uh, this is a slightly more general answer than the specific one yeah, you but, asking, but uh, Can I do a follow-up? Yeah, sure. mm. yeah, because I think your, your answer is coherent with that kind of metaphysics because yeah. it's a criteria of, a, of, a, of, a, of existence also. So, so it's not just a criteria of classification, it's existence. It's yeah. part of the what to be what you are, like, like, like Jonathan Lowe was defending. So, so you cannot be a real pluralist because you cannot. Yeah. You just cannot. It's it's for it's forbidding. <laughs> if if the identity of a thing is also some some properties are part of the the criterion of existence, pluralism is out. At least mm. in a metaphysical mm. strong sense. Yeah. Yeah. But can't you be that electron and fermion? But that's hierarchical. That's not on the same level. Okay, so it's real pluralism. Yes, yeah, you've got, if you've got, so, so the electron fermion case is, is, is easier, but, but it's the cross-cutting cases. Um, I wish I could remember a good example. So, uh, a simple example Plat from Platypus. You know, Platypus, they're oviparous, they, they lay eggs, and birds lay eggs as well, but the Platypus can't be classified as, as a bird, obviously. but. Uh, Platypus is a mammal, but mammals don't lay, lay eggs in general. So, so you get this, I mean, it's a silly example, really. <laughs> but it just shows how these biological categorizations are cross-cutting often, because you can't classify the platypus nicely together with all the, all the mammal, mammals as being not egg-laying, or, or, or birds as being egg-laying, because it doesn't have all the other shared properties that birds have. Platypus is a nice example anyway, because they're so weird. But, you know, uh, so, so you can find these sort of, uh, some of the better examples that I can't remember now uh, are trickier in, in, in explaining how, how the cross-cutting should be understood there. And I think, I, I mean, some of the chemical cases could could touch on this as well, yeah. actually, um, when you get to sort of bigger yeah, things. I think, think that, or maybe it's Robin who went to the example, I think, of metals. Yeah. It can be cross-cutting if you look at your colleague to... Yeah, I, I forget the details. Yeah, example. yeah, you, you need to work out the details. So, so but, but so, so, so those cases are interesting. But the general answer, of course, that I I, I can have here is is you're, you're right. Uh, well, some of those cases turn out to be well, one of them's you know not, not a real kind. So there isn't genuine cross cutting there, or the cross cutting is sort of more epistemic in in, in nature, um, or there's just fundamental natural kinds. So they don't, you don't get this. But the, the interesting thing about philosophy of biology is that for decades there was a discussion what is the, the real criterion of biological individuals? Yeah. Unit of selection, yeah. physiological unit of selection. And finally now everybody is happy since they adopt the pluralism. But I don't understand how because clearly they changed criterion of, uh, of identity or not criterion of existence anymore. Or, it yeah, sense. well, that's well, that's true. That that would be if you, you if you're a genuine what, pluralist, that would be that would be a cost there. Because yeah. you don't know how to on what you quantify. Something must give you the, the unit of quantification, some criteria. So I, I thought that uh, that a popular way to look at it is just to look at the lineage um, mm -hmm. and, and just identify the species purely purely on that on that basis. Um, in which case, I mean, it's not going to solve all the cases. But it's going to give you a pretty good criteria. But of course, I'm, I'm trying to be compatible with that sort of view because if you look at the lineage and you look at the entire lineage, <laughs> you're going to end up in the same place every time. <laughs> There's just one lineage, right? Thank you. Good. I think it's in Chakravarti, I think that's how. Your natural kinds may be pragmatically defined, but they may be still natural in the sense that there are uh, bundles of properties that are natural in the sense that they have a natural bunch. So, like, the way you, quite, you do your taxonomy may be, may be pragmatic, mm, while yeah. they are still metaphysically uh, something that is natural in a way. Of, uh, 
Yeah. So, I, I'm sure it answers all the way to this question. But. Yeah, mm, I'm a, I'm a bit un uncomfortable with with that line un unless we're clear about what the ontology is on the background. So, so on the type of robustly realist picture that I'm having here, the, the pragmatic stuff better not yeah. influence <laughs> influence the ontology. Now. That doesn't mean that we can't make pragmatic selections on these cases. In fact, it might turn out that we do them in a lot of cases. But the, the ontology doesn't uh, doesn't need to suffer from that necessarily. Now, I don't know. What, I mean, the reason why I'm hesitating a little bit is well, because Chakravarti goes towards type of sort of anti-realist picture, and his most recent work is at least you know kind of a one Francis stance type of yeah. picture that where he ends up. And, and then the criteria get, get messy for my. This is why they accept the resistance. He wants to accept the resistance, but he has yeah. resistance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, I don't necessarily <laughs> accept the stance, uh, the stance yeah, okay. approach here. Yeah. So, um, so it ha I have to tread a bit carefully. Other <laughs> 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 uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the for the talk. I hope I got them right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 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 Thank True. Yeah, yeah, you don't, don't have to go to trans urine calamus for that. So, indeed, yeah. indeed. And so, I guess a very similar kind of reason can be used there. And so, we, we, can, we can know about these substances that we're about to make for the very first time mm -hmm. because of our knowledge of all the other chemical substances and the way they tend to react with one another. So, we can, we can kind of Theorize about this and write out that whenever I'll take this substance and this substance, this purification is bound to happen, and so I will have substance X with these and these and properties. But so, where do you locate know, the true name for them? Um, well, I guess it depends on, on, on the cases, but I'm, I'm just thinking, well, some of those some of those cases would depend quite heavily, as, you, as, as I'm sure you can tell me more about, on the, on the type of bond. Uh, that in effect, and we we know you know there's, there's a uh, if if the substance were ended up if the, if the chemical substance were ended up with it is it's going to be governed by a certain type of bond structure, then it'll have certain type of properties. So we've got existing cases of those bonds. Effectively, those are kind of dependence relation. You know, you've got your carbon carbon there, <laughs> uh, and and you can you can get to some of the properties there. Now, whether you can get to all of the properties is a so easily is, is another matter, but I think that that would be one good work, good way to go. Um, I mean, I like uh, Robin talks about uh, the nuclear charge. Often in these cases, that even even in, in compounds, the nuclear charge still has a has a key uh, role in, in uh, pre predicting and determining the chemical properties. Now that might be controversial, though, at least. In, some more complex cases, but in some, some cases, cases, might be might be that the nuclear charge is part of the truth maker. So, so, so the answer is well, let's let's do some empirical work and try to figure out um, where where we can locate those truth makers. And sometimes it might be epistemically quite difficult, of course. I mean, I imagine that this is going to be very tricky in in uh, in the sort of macromolecule space, right? And of course, uh, you know, things like uh, protein folding. Uh, we are not very good at predicting those things at all. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a context contest for for AIs to predict uh, protein structure based on on the, the primary structure. Um, so that's an interesting case of, of uh, what what could possibly be be the truth makers for this um, for the, you know the, for some sort of yet to be synthesized. Uh, yeah. uh, um, you know, four dimensional structure there. Um, but, you know, I think these are, these are interesting puzzles, but they're mainly scientific or empirical questions. 
Um, so, uh, so we can we can hopefully do some more work for this. On this, uh, I mean, I've got I've got more more detail on the uh, on the transuranic case in the in the paper I've I've published. But maybe I should think think about those. I haven't really thought about those cases of just coming up with substances. I mean, part of the reason is that they're more complicated, of course. So it's much more difficult to, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. trace those. Um, but you know, uh, you could be encouraged that this type of solution is, is the right way to go just by the fact that we are really good at predicting the properties of, of, of yet to be synthesized compounds in many cases. I mean, we might already have in mind the property that we want uh, from a compound yeah. uh, when we start that work. Yeah. But I have good examples from the top of my head. But, 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 but what exactly is the truth maker then? For, for example, the transfer in case, but what do you think to be the truth maker of? Elements, so, uh, is it is it the, the other elements with magic numbers? Is it is it the theory about them? So, so the example, the specific example, or the specific kind of factual that I stated to kind of precise by it is it was the um, the longer half life, right? Yeah. And and so that seems to be uh, made true by the by the properties of uh, of the electron shell configuration, I suppose. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, I mean, which property is it? Is it exactly? Uh, I mean, the, the way we arrive at this is by this theory of magic numbers, of course. But uh, it's the it's the it's the electron shell structure that gives you gives you the detailed answer answers to this. So the energy levels of the uh, of uh, of that structure. So um, I'm just trying to cheat here to to remember what I said about this exactly. <laughs> so. So this is what I said, that the truth makers for that sort of counterfactual, so if only hemisphere existed, it would have a longer half-life than organism, um, would be the actual energy states of the nucleus and the positions and their positions in the potential well. So that would give the higher stability in cases where, where we have the closed shells. And you know, the theory comes from the, th the magic, magic numbers of the nucleus, of course. Um, but because the actual, uh, I mean, the actual nuclear structure of, of that element, of course, also doesn't exist. No, no, that nuclear shell structure doesn't exist. But the dependencies uh, can be can be modeled already. So the dependencies are the same in in all of those cases. So that's that's the idea. Um, so we know that the that the nuclear uh, nucleus, which are you know this, uh, you know, this all consists of the same subatomic uh, particles. So the Ultimately, we're talking about the dependencies between those subatomic particles that get more and more complicated, of course, as the, as the elements get bigger. But it's not like there's a fundamental difference in those cases, and that's exactly why the, the magic numbers build up there. And we can model them accurately, you know, going beyond the actual cases. Right? So, um, so I guess, uh, I guess what I need to emphasize in these cases, because I, I, I nearly, I nearly uh, tripped myself here, is that you really can't uh, consider the cases in isolation, but rather, uh, rather you have to consider the, the, the entire dependent structure that gets uh, that emerges from, from the dependencies between the various particles. And that, that, this is a good example because it's, it's of course not a single entity that gives you, uh, gives you truth maker, uh, that acts as a truth maker for any of these cases, you know. But rather the, uh, the interplay between the various entities that participate in the uh, uh, in the given element. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and and those dependencies are the, are the same in all of these cases. It, it, could, it could be argued because they all consist of the same sub uh, subatomic particles. Um, so once we have that dependence, <coughs> place to where we can extrapolate into 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 cases where uh, uh, where the same dependent structure emerges, but there's just more. More players in a way. <laughs> uh, good. I hope I got that wrong. Right. <laughs> but I, I mean, but it makes those compound cases even more complicated because there's so many things yeah. playing together. So you'd have to yeah. tra trace all those cases. Yeah. Well, that's that's all for me too. I was I was going to head in that direction because it's a, a similar uh, another actually I think really nice case for you because it's how to put it. 
in some physics that trans uranium case on steroids. Um, <laughs> people, in, people in synthetic biology do this all the yeah, time. Now, yeah. Right? Okay. So you can walk up to a, there are, you, you, there are people working in drug development who start out by just walking up to a chalkboard and thinking about what they wish a protein would do. Yes. They sketch for a while and then they conjure the damn thing into existence. And this is like a thing we can do now. Right, and that's. I mean, there. I think. I think. Yeah. I. I was. I, I like where you landed because I think where you landed can support can support that. Now. Now that's a an unfathomably complicated dependency network. Oh, by yeah. the time you get to something like we're building a protein because we think we want to interact with this this element in the cell at this point in yeah. this kind of cycle. Um, what it's going to take to to say justifiably, I think that if we did this, it would work. Um, it's going to be a ne that, that that network's going to get really gross. Uh, yeah. But this is I mean this is something I've been I've been I've been playing with this. Um, I just wonder I've been playing with this in a, in a project that we're going to do someday probably. Um, <laughs> thinking about state space thinking in biology mm -hmm. um, because I think it's I think it's everywhere and. Uh, a, uh, a fellow Finn, uh, Rami Koskinen, has written some interesting stuff yeah. about exactly this, but he's one of like three people who's ever actually slowed down to think about uh, uh, to think about what possibility in biology means. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's a really cool question, and I think you've given us some really neat tools. So that was really just a long-winded comment, and maybe maybe that synthetic bio case is a cool one to, to explore if you want to find, like, dial the complexity to 11. Uh -huh. um, Good. It might be, it might be helpful. Yeah, th thanks very much. I'm very glad you mentioned this. I have I have thought about synthetic biology case, but I uh, I haven't gone into details. I'm familiar with Rami's work, of course, uh, so so I know that there's there's a lot of potential in that regard. And yes, I do think that this type of model works precisely in those sort of those sort of cases as well. So I I think that I should like to next go into that uh, that work, but I just haven't had the time to read up on synthetic <laughs> biology enough. Um, but yeah, um, no, I mean, just to say something more, uh, it's interesting because, you know, everyone knows, as you've just indicated, that there's going to be a crazy amount of different dependencies going on there. Who, who could possibly think about them all at the same time? Well, we, we don't really, uh, because we know that we kind of take shortcuts yeah. in that we, we've, we've already discovered some things that work and some things that, uh, I mean, you know, speculating how they actually do this work in the lab, but uh, but some processes that that produce no results, uh, some chemical reactions that produce no results, and we can rely on and build on all that all that work without sort of actively considering all the dependencies that work on the background, right? Yeah. Because, and you know, sometimes accidents happen, and you're like, oh well, wow, that that worked out or <laughs> better than I anticipated. Um, but you know, the ontology of the background doesn't change from that. Uh, you. You have the known structures. You have the known processes that uh, uh, that are ultimately built up from these these uh, very complicated networks of, of di uh, dependencies. I mean, the, uh, I don't know if they use AI a, a lot yet. This is a biology, but I'm sure they will. Uh, but the the idea of uh, predicting uh, uh, protein structures based on the primary structure is a very interesting case uh, uh, of, of what the AI is grasping there because. I don't think that the, the cases where I know uh, have been researched, I don't think that the AI is actually grasping the dependencies. It's just extrapolating from uh, from a, the big data set, like in large language models. I don't think that the AI actually understands the language. And in this case as well, it's not doing quite the same same work, I, 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 I feel. But if we could feed in the dependencies into the AI model, that would be more effective. <laughs> so being, building it from the uh, from the from the parts that actually do the work. So so right right now I, I and this is a guess again. I feel like the AI is based more <coughs> on sort of lucky uh, lucky connections from the big data data sets rather than uh, you know first principles. <laughs> Good. But yeah, really glad you mentioned that. I again it's homework for me because I should read up much more on the synthetic biology. But it's it's a, Good to hear that you guys are working on it already. One day. One day.
I kind of exchange the idea of the YouTube like that. Does that make any sense? I get YouTube to do it. Quite, yeah. No, that's, a, that's great. Thanks. Other questions? Last Nobody else. It's kind of technical. I mean, I'm mm. fascinated by the idea that they are not entities themselves, substances. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> especially because of the kind of, uh, you said it's not a set, it's not a problem. Like, like entities in a very broad sense, uh, it's not even that. Mm -hmm. but then you say, I propose to read essence as identity and existence conditions of an entity. So, conditions is plural. Suggests maybe a set kind of thing. Well, <laughs> um, so, so, so what? And, and this, this this regress argument. Um, mm. I'm not sure whether it's so problematic. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, a regress is problematic. That's a definition, but maybe there's a characterization possible. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, and, 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 and I mean, there's a whole kind of language that suggests that it would be uh, um, uh, entities, even like the, the essence of essences, uh, like the whole linguistic, like the, the grammar of it, uh, of the whole note, so the whole talk suggests that there would be yes, uh, entities of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe of a weird sort, but. Um, and then I wonder, like, could I maybe um, read this differently um, and, and see it more as a sort of a, a connector, uh, um, an operator, uh, like something that, that we, we call an essence, that actually the thing is assen it's essential for X to blah, 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 something like that. Yeah, it's, it has a functional purpose uh, in, 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 in the framework and a logician would like try to come up with some... But the function is also an entity, right? It's kind of sad. Uh, but but so to, to avoid that, it's just that there in the language, uh, like it necessarily is, you don't have to buy into necess necessities as entities. Mm -hmm. Can just like talk about necessarily and define the rules of necessarily. Um, maybe essentially could also be something like that. And the, its function would be what is important about it. That it's not a function. I mean, in that proposal, that would be for me a way out, a way, a, a coherent way out of the idea that it's really not an, an, an entity at all. There's no reification of it. It, it, it. Nothing like that. It, it's just, it's just an operator. And that's yeah. just a suggestion. I'm not at all. That's a question for, for a magician. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, could, I, I mean, there's definitely more to be to be said about that. So, so you're you're, you're right to, to raise that question, and I, I'm not I'm not opposed to that sort of operator kind of thinking of this. I mean, it works. Um, it works if you look at think of logic and logic of essence as well, and the, the, the it just works works as a sort of operator yeah. right, from. So, so you could you could do the work and 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 kind of think of it in this way. But, but so, so there's, and, and there are people who, not many people, but there are a couple of people, Nicholas Spinelli, I think, has a paper on this, which, which responds to Lowe on this infinite reg regress case and suggests a, a kind of a way out, which, which may or may not work, but, uh, but a few people have suggested that that regress issue is not necessarily as serious as it, as it might turn out to be. But, but so here's, here's a question. So if we did think of, if we think that there's a, you know, the regress isn't problematic, or we can solve the regress, we're still going to have to say, well, if the essences are entities, then presumably they're entities of, that belong to some some category of, of being, right? If we if we're if we're doing this sort of category of ontology anyway, um, which is definitely a side point here. So, which category do they belong to? Are they are they properties? You know, one of the fundamental ontological categories. Well, but the essences of the other. Uh, categories of entities would then have as their essence uh, an entity from another fundamental ontological category. So you know the essence of uh, of a substance would be would be a property which 
belonging to this other form, the form, uh, formal ontological category, that would mess up the, the formal ontological relations of the, of the type of ontological picture that at least yes. was. I, th I think so. That would be like incoherent. I mean, would it be a weird picture of things hanging together rather than like this fundamentalist uh, idea of some basic categories and all the rest like from there? But as long as it hangs together and you have a nice characterization, I'm, I'm happy. Like, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, at least you'd maybe you'd then have to say that whatever category that those essences and entities belong to has to be, has to be the more, more, more fundamental category than the others because all the other categories <coughs> depend on that category in some sense on, on this type of picture. Or maybe you'd have to say, well, there's a further fundamental ontological category, category or essence, you know, and that's where everything's uh, linked to. Yeah, well, but it does mean yeah, that you have to postulate a further, further ontological category, so it's not that, it doesn't seem like the most, yeah. most, uh, you know, conservative uh, approach. So, so I mean, if you can understand what's happening here just based on on this uh, um, non-entity conception of essence, then I think I think it is more more promising because you'd have to work out the, the logic of this. And I mean, notoriously, people who do sort of reify essences, they don't necessarily say much about that very question. So, so you might just say that well, it's just a bundle of properties. You know, so the essence of an electron just is to have, you know, its mass and charge and happy to get spin. And, and the essence is just that set or bundle of the properties or, or the proposition expressing whatever. Each, each way of going here ends up in the same sort of area. But then the question is, well, what, what unifies those properties into that essence exactly? So what, what's exactly doing the work here? Uh, David Orderberg has... has Kind of an answer to, to this type of view, but it's very much based on how you know homomorphism, which is not something that I uh, necessarily accept here. Um, so, so look, I mean, it, it's, there are ways to, to go here, but uh, but I I am not convinced by any of the obvious alternatives here. I mean, one one way which you, which you kind of I suppose um, hinted towards as well would be to take them as kind of a linguistic entity. Uh, I mean that could that could work up to a point, but it seems it seems unnecessary to yeah. to think about them as as, as it's further. Weird to have language in your basic components. Yeah, preci precisely, precisely. But an operator is not like that, right? An operator is not. Yeah. So. And it's not it's not something. It's 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 something you work with. I mean. That's right. I that's right. Say something, but like if you if you're interpreting theory. You don't have to have an object that corresponds. Yeah. To it yeah. Agreed. Um, so that 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 could work, but you better not think about it then in the same way as, as maybe. I mean, some people might think of logical constants as uh, as entities as well, uh, and they would have a nature as as well. You know, the, Kid Fine talks about the 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 essence of you know conjunction and. and uh, if the if conjunction has an essence, can you can you return that to the operator view? Well, maybe you can. No, I, I don't. I don't, I, I don't think there's any. The fact that we use conjunctions doesn't mean that we have to have them in our ontology, right? Um, it's not because it likes to. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you, yeah, you, you can say. Yeah, you can say that that the constants aren't aren't enti entities of any. Any kind, and they're just <coughs> similar, similar to the operator. That's just something we work with. So that's, that is as possible. Yeah. I, I, well, look um, to to finish my <laughs> my uh, my my answer, as it were. Uh, I I think that that operator view probably comes closest to to what I have in mind uh, of of the kind of options that are on the on the table here, because then you don't have to have to reify them, yeah. reify the essences and. As you see, the essences for me, at least, are just something that you work with rather than <laughs> that's something that yeah, I'm in addition to. That's why I'm very attractive. <laughs> and yeah, I mean that's the that's the conservative choice as well. You don't add things that you don't need in the ontology. You just you just have the things you have in the ontology, and those things have some relations, and that's what gives you the picture.
Good, thanks. But that's helpful. I'm, I'll, maybe it help, helps to specify the operator view actually as a sort of example of well, what, what could they be? Well, think of operators yeah. or some entities themselves. So I keep this in mind. More questions? You know that the brain is he takes the senses to be uh, crazy universals that are instantiated by you know yeah. individual electrons, for example. Yeah. Electronhood, you know, because you 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 coin you know, this word, you know, and which designates the essence you know, of uh, 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 electrons is uh, not instantiated in electrons, so it's not it's not a property like. Uh, negative charge or spin, uh -huh. but it's uh, it's a uh, it's a sui generis universal, mm. uh, which he calls a quasi universal, and uh, but uh, it's it's a uh, I think it it belongs to 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 the same category of properties, but it's very special kind of property, as he says. Uh, so I, yeah. I don't agree with that. You know, I just want to 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 have your uh, your. Uh, oh, yeah, that's. That, that. Thanks, that's good. So I, I yeah, I don't remember the details of Edison on this at, at all, but that rings a that rings a bell. I, I should maybe have a have another look at that. So I'm I always just so I think of Edison has a six category ontology, right? Uh, so he's got he's got two kinds of universe, but but there's there's a further quasi universal which is the which is the essence, but it's it's something that is maybe in the property category. It's no. almost. Property, but, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Mm, it's, it's kind of has a strange ring to it. But um, I'll have to. Yeah, I don't remember how 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 he details this. But but it seems it seems yeah, unnecessary. But you say that, that you said, uh, it uh, just said about you know how when does uh, uh, I, I am myself in favor of the bundle of properties. You know, I mm. think we can do with the physics of laws because of what yeah. We have. Without the senses and without natural kinds, and because of powers, you know, are mm. are enough. But okay, that's another program. Should not unrelated. But he uh, says that well, we 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 need senses, uh, kind of uh, uh, according to Edis, because uh, of uh, explanationist requirements. So it's like an inference to the best explanation. And I want to explain, you know, how the. Uh, uh, these uh, these properties like uh, as a spin one half, negative charge, uh, uh, a specific mass, and mm -hmm. all those uh, properties cohere. You know, they, they, they say there is a there is a necessity link between those properties, yeah, and, and, and yeah. it, it says explains. You know, I think it, it's very mysterious. You know, what he claims, you know, the sense explains why those properties you know, are, are always bound together. You know, yeah, yeah. Nature. Well, I don't, I mean, it's it's puzzling to, to me that Ellis, uh, Ellis would say that as well, because I think he also has substantial kind universals in the ontology. Yeah. And uh, to my mind, the exa ex uh, explanation for why these properties go together is, is very simple. It's because the substantial kind universal electron is. Uh, rigidly dependent on those properties. So there's a dependence relation there between that kind and, and the properties that characterize it. Uh, and, and that's, that's where you've got, got the explanation. explanation. It's, uh, there's, behind, behind every explanation, every explanation there's a dependence relation. <laughs> and, and the dependence relation here is a formal ontological dependence relation between the kind and the properties that characterize it, really. Uh, which you don't need to, to, to verify the essence there. It's essential dependence, yes, but it's based on the essences of uh, two different kinds of entities, property universals and kind universals. <laughs> but people, people do talk about, I mean, Martin Glacier, for instance, talks about the ex explanatory essences. I think I, I, can, I can understand that talk and, and even agree with it if I can return or reduce that talk to not postulate the essence as the explanatory entity there, but the essential dependence relations between various entities as, as being the base of the explanation. So, so you know, explanations track dependencies. In this case, they track essential dependencies. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I can get by with, with less. <laughs> 
I mean, obviously, I still need all these categories, but. <laughs> So can I step for one last question? Yeah. You have time. I have one. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, we're we're having it for sure, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> we have time going afterwards. Um, since uh, since essence uh, precedes uh, existence, could you could you elaborate about what you see out as? Some constraints on the demand of essences, or or any, or oh, you um. Uh, so what kind of stuff can be there? So, uh, are you talking about what I maybe what I talk uh, mentioned as these, I guess, candidate essences because all the yeah, existing exactly. things. Yeah, Here we seem to all talk about natural properties yeah. as or measurable at least <laughs> measurable properties as. Constituting the domains, but do you see that as a restriction? Do you see it bigger? What kind of things could be in a criteria of identity in existence? Good. Yeah. So, so I think that the first question is, if we're, and I, I mean, it's it's good to be in in a place where we can talk in the, in this sort of way, sort some sort of categorical ontology. So, mm -hmm. so your first restriction is probably going to be, uh, well, how many fundamental ontological categories there are, and what are they? So you start out with, I mean, almost everyone accepts properties as, uh, or tropes, you know, if, if you like a trope bundle theorist, I suppose. So at least there's there's some there's some sort of starting point here. And you, well, pe there are people who try to get by with one category, right? Uh, and a trope bundle theorist might be one, but then you have all sorts of issues with that. But what you need to do is is build those dependencies based on, on, on that category structure. That's why a one category ontology seems very problematic to me, actually, because you don't seem to have uh, dependencies between the categories, so you don't have the formal ontological structure and necessary richness to, to, to build up uh, you know, all the things that we, we need in our ontology. Um, but that's, I think that's the, probably the first constraint. And, and then there's the question of whether there are things like the law of non-contradiction, perhaps, that govern uh, those relations uh, themselves that they have to follow some some sort of uh, uh, some sort of logical principles about which kind of entities can exist together in the first, first place. So could contradictory properties, you know, be instantiated in the same entity at the same time? Maybe you want to rule that out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I mean that's that's the starting point. Um, you know, to be able to agree on that starting point does. Requires to make some <laughs> uh, make some sacrifices, perhaps, but uh, but I think that's uh, you know <laughs> that's life. <laughs> Thank you. So we have two minutes. If you want to question short, your question short, you have two minutes. <laughs> 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 I want I want to get back to the essence of the existing things. Okay. Yeah, it's so difficult to think of good examples. Oxygen, so of course, I, I, I'm going to treat this. Uh, I'm trying to understand how the kind of important thing is. Well, I haven't worked this out. I mean, I only thought of this as a potential example on the way on, on the train uh, over, over here. Um, so, so it, it, yeah, I thought that maybe. Um, Maybe the reason is that there's uh, some sort of an overlap between the supposed identity and existence conditions of phlogiston and what we now know is, is oxygen, and maybe other things as well. So I'm not saying that there, there's a perfect overlap there. And it and it seems that um, in the in the in the same actual actual space, uh, it would be very odd to have both of those those things because they do seem to. Do some of the same things as well, so that you know, in chemical reactions where where oxygen participates, uh, it seems like it, it, there would be some violation if there's both oxygen and phlogiston acting together, or something something yeah. like that. So uh, I mean, it's because, it's because like, so it's because they're playing the same role basically, or or at least supposed yeah. to play the same role. Because I mean, you can say the electro uh, its essence is it has to have a certain mass, spin yeah. half, and a negative charge, 
uh, what if you change negative charge into a positive charge? Well, I mean, yeah, sure. Positive. So, so yeah. I mean, but, but of course, they do also play very different roles. So it yeah. would be if, if you would have those two entities playing the same role, that yeah, if you if you uh, if you explain combustion by the you know, oxygen, which is uh, uh, captured from the atmosphere, uh, uh, whereas the phlogiston is something that is released, mm -hmm. I, I was I mean, those are two, there are two contradictory entities. I mean, so if one exists, the other one doesn't exist. That's that's the thought, yeah, yeah. That's the thought, but I that's mean, I haven't worked out details. On the other hand, you know, you know, there is a debate in the philosophy of science. You know, does oxygen uh, oxygen uh, refers to the same thing as uh, what uh, Priestley called the phlogisticated yeah. air? Sure. Yeah. Right? The phlogisticated air is not phlogiston. It's uh, it's uh, it's a gas without phlogiston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so it seems. I mean, you might say that well, the idea of existence conditions for phlogiston aren't even well, well formed or something like that. But, but I mean, it was pretty well formed as I understand the history of chemistry as a as a as a concept, right? As a candidate. But, but then when we found out the other stuff that does exist, ox namely o oxygen. And well, probably understood some of the combustion processes a bit better anyway. Then, then it seems like some sort of a contradiction could be could be derived if they both both were that. But <coughs> yeah. I mean, one would have a negative weight and one would have a positive weight, so that would be things different. I would say. Yeah, I mean, they were kind of. That's one of the reasons they gave up on this one. Yeah, they they had to assume it would have a negative weight because right. it has to be combusted mentally. It gets heavier. How is that possible? That's a good point. Yeah, so that would have a. Have some sort of property, property of negative weight. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the history of physics, there are very strange physics that have been so uh, the history of physics is very strange. Yeah. In itself, I mean, virtual exchange particles that don't have any yeah, yeah. weight. That, that's I, I still don't know how to understand them really. <laughs> so, so do they have a very idea of existence conditions? I'm not sure. Yeah. So, I mean, if anyone has any ideas, any better candidates for for what could exclude the existence of some other entity, then then I'm all all, all ears. Um, but no. The point is that you have phlogiston, as you say, also phlogiston and oxygen they have contradictory properties. Yeah, yeah. If that if that is the case, then that does seem to. Be, you know, at least if we accept that contradictory properties are something that we want to have. Quantum logic. Yeah. 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 That's why I mean, I was always having the caveat that. Good. Anyway, but it's anything else to be honest.